Hey, what's up? Jason here from Unity3D.College. Today we're going to talk about the dependency inversion principle. This is the D in the solid principles. And it's a pretty important, pretty big one, but it's also a little bit hard to understand and a bit harder to implement in Unity than in normal projects. So if you're in a web project or a Windows project, dependency injection frameworks are pretty standard. You'll usually start with a dependency injection framework, and then it makes it really easy to build your project up so that all of your dependencies just get injected into the things that need them and you don't really have to worry about that. With Unity, it's a little bit different because we don't just write everything in code and we don't want everything kind of built up right at runtime. A lot of the time you want things in scenes, you have prefabs, you have scriptable objects, and it's not just all code that just you know, can get kind of tossed together in a bootstrapper. So instead, we follow the principle, but a little bit differently. And I want to show how to do that in Unity, or how I do it in Unity at least. And I also want to point out there are dependency injection frameworks available for Unity. I've played with them a little bit. They're kind of cool, but they always feel like they're kind of fighting against Unity and making it a little bit harder to make the project instead of easier. Um, I'm sure there are cases for some projects where it makes total sense and it makes everything easier. But in my experience, it's not been the best. So I, I like to go with this slightly modified approach here. So I'm gonna start off with this spaceship right here. And if we take a look at it, you see we've just got a spaceship motor with a couple settings on it. I can hit play and I can fly this spaceship around. All right, so I use the arrow keys or the controller and I can turn and move forward and backwards. I crank up my turn speed a little bit. Oh, that's not nearly enough. There we go, crank up my turn speed a bit so I can actually turn at a reasonable rate. And you know, I can play and move around my ship. So let's look at the script and see how that works. It's pretty simple. It's a uh, kind of what you'd expect from a straightforward just movement script. We have two fields for turn speed and move speed that are serialized so they show up in the editor. Then we read the input and we rotate based off the rotation from the input, delta time and turn speed, and then we do the movement based off of forward times thrust times delta time times move speed. So all pretty simple stuff, but there is a clear violation of this dependency inversion principle and that our ship motor which is really supposed to be responsible for moving the ship, right? It's responsible for turning and moving, and that's it. But it's also taking over the task of input reading, so it's breaking the single responsibility principle, and it's requiring a reference to this static input.getaccess access call. So here we have a dependency that's just kind of hidden in our motor where we can only really read from input for this one axis. So it'll only work for one player, it won't work for AI, it won't work for network stuff. Our ship motor is essentially limited to one possible type of functionality. It's got all of its dependencies in here. So let's see how we can split that out a little bit. And then once we do it a little, we'll split it out some more and start actually cleaning things up. So here we've got demo version two where we have our ship and our ship has a motor, but it also has a ship input. So I want to take a look at this. We'll go into the code. And here you'll see we still have these same two fields, a turn speed and a move speed. We also have a private reference to a ship input, and that's filled in our awake. So normally with dependency inversion, we, well, at least I personally, prefer to inject things in the constructor. We don't have a constructor with mono behaviors, and we don't have an easy way to pass things in on creation of a mono behavior that feels clean. So what we can do is just get the dependency in the awake method. We could also have like a set input method where we actually set the input of the ship motor maybe later on. And I think in a real game, we may end up doing that because you might want to change who's controlling the ship. Maybe it's a player controlling it and then AI needs to be able to take over as well. And in there, we're doing more of a property injection where we're just swapping out the property instead of doing it in the constructor or the awake method, which is our kind of fake constructor for now. Um, but this works too, right? Just for a single ship where we don't need to change it, we just get the input in the awake and we're done. Now in update, we read the ship input rotation and the thrust, and we do the same exact movement stuff. And let's take a real quick look at the ship input. And here you'll see we're just reading the input. So we our code's a little bit better, right? We're reading input specifically in its own class it's still a separate mono behavior and we're not getting a whole lot out of this, but we could go in and modify this and just replace this 
ship input split with a ship AI input, and then all of a sudden it's an AI ship, the motor still works, and we didn't have to change anything on the motor. But we're gonna split this out a lot more, and things are gonna get a little bit more complicated, but a whole lot cleaner. So here we have version three. Now if we look at version three, you see what we have here now, instead of a ship motor and a ship input, we just have a ship and it's got some settings on it. So let's take a look at this. In our ship, you see that we have a reference to a ship settings. That's the settings for our ship. You'll see that in a moment. Uh, we also have two private fields. We have an I ship input. Now, if you haven't used interfaces before, the I is just there to indicate that it's an interface not an actual concrete implementation. And we'll go over interfaces in just a moment. And then we have a reference to a ship motor. In Awake, we're actually creating some of this stuff. So this is somewhat like our you know, WPF or web app uh, bootstrapper part where we're actually creating up the object and doing all the preparation just in this one spot. Now here we're doing it in the ship's Awake. We're not doing it in a global bootstrapper but this is still pretty consolidated. We just have one spot where the ship kind of prepares itself. Now here, the first thing we do is check to see what type of ship input we want. So our ship settings, let's take a quick look at it. Ship settings has three fields on it, a turn speed, a move speed, and an option to use AI. So if our use AI option is on, our ship input is going to be a new AI input. If it's not on, we're gonna get a new controller input. And we can kind of show that a little bit better just by splitting this out. If you haven't used this operator before, it essentially means that if this is true, set the value to this. If it's false, take the value that's after the colon and set it to that. So we're either setting it to a new AI input or a new controller input. And then we create a new ship motor, but take a look at this. We're just passing in, or we're calling ship motor equals new ship motor. And we're passing in the input, the transform, and the ship settings. And you may notice that we're newing this up. That's because it's no longer a mono behavior. So since we don't need it to be a mono behavior, it isn't one. Now I'm gonna go into the ship motor real quick and let's just take a look at how we're doing this. So here we're actually using some constructor injection. We are taking in that ship input, using that interface again, the I ship input, the transform that we want to move and the settings for the ship. And here in the constructor, we just cache these off. So into these three read-only variables. And these are read-only because they're assigned in the constructor only, and that read-only attribute means that they just can't be changed after that. So we don't have to worry about anything possibly breaking these. Now we also have a, oh, we have two floats here that we're not using. Can delete, delete those out and clean things up. We also have a tick method here. And in this, you'll see that we're doing the rotation. We're doing transform to move dot rotate, and we're using the ship input dot rotation so we're not getting the rotation in here, we're getting it from our ship input. And then we're using the ship settings turn speed. So again, we're not getting that from here, we're getting it from an external dependency, this ship settings. So now our ship motor is only responsible for rotating and moving based off of other components and what other components want. It doesn't have to know what type of input we have, it doesn't have to you know, be on the object itself as a mono behavior and we don't have to have the settings in here. They can be in a single shared spot. Now let's jump over to the project one more time and I wanna go over some of these other scripts. So here, let's actually go back into the ship script and I wanna take a look at the iShip input. So let's see, let's open that up right here. We have iShip input and here you see we have just an interface with three things on it. We have read input, which just means that anything that implements this is going to have to have a method called read input with a void return. We also have a rotation and a thrust with a only a getter set. That just means that these anything that implements this interface is also going to have to be able to return back a rotation and a thrust. We don't have to be able to set it externally, we just have to be able to read it. Now let's take a look at our controller input. Remember if we look at our ship, we're instantiating a controller input right now because use AI is set to false. So let's look at that. Controller input implements the iShip input interface, which means it has this read input. And in this read input, we set, get the rotation and the thrust. And here we just have those two variables. Notice that this is set to private, so we can't set rotation and thrust outside of here. But we also have an AI input script. So this also implements the iShip input interface. And here when we read input, we just right now pick some random values. So ideally we come up with a solution where the AI is a little bit smarter, maybe turns towards you, 
does something logical for its input. But for now, random values work and kind of show the idea. So if we go back into the ship one more time, see that if ship settings use AI as set, we'll use that AI input. Otherwise, we're going to the controller input. Now let's take a look at the ship settings and how that's set up. So here, remember I talked about property injection. This is a great example of property injection, and it's something that we do a lot in Unity, which is just assigning an object, either another game object, a prefab, or a scriptable object, to a field in here. So you can think of this a lot like you would just normal dependency injection. You're just defining what gets injected in the editor instead of in a script like a bootstrapper script or an XML file for your dependency injection system. So here, which by the way, XML ones are pretty terrible. I'd avoid those. Um, anyway, so back to the ship settings. So here, we, like I said, we're just passing in the ship settings. And the one that we're passing in right now is this ship player data. So here's where my settings are for this ship. I know that this ship has the ship data player and I can modify settings right in there. Now let's say I wanted to make an AI ship. I'll just duplicate this thing, drag it over, and then let's create a new script for this. So here, actually, let's open up the ship settings script just so you can see how this is made again. So we have this create asset menu attribute and that allows us to just right click in the project view and create a new one. And then you have the default values right here. So turn speed, move speed, and UI to AI. And these are all set to private. That's just so that when we use them from another thing, we can't modify them. So I don't want, you know, if I have another script that wants to read these turn speeds, I only want it to be able to read them. I don't want it writing them and then changing my scriptable objects. So I keep these private floats here and then just add a public getter only property so that I can read them without being able to update them. So let's go back in and let's create a new one. So we'll right click, create, go to ship and go to settings and we'll call this AI ship data. Now here, I'm just gonna check the use AI. I'm gonna maybe turn up the turn speed. Maybe these AI ones turn a bit faster and I'll leave it moving. I'm gonna actually make it move slow. So just gonna spin around pretty slow. So select this one, drop the AI ship data, hit play again. And now we should be able to both control our ship. There we go, I can control this one. And the AI is controlling that one. Now again, the AI is not very good at it because it's just doing some random selection of what it should do, but it works and everything is nicely separated out. Now I could easily swap in different controllers for these and just inject in the other thing or change the, uh, no, change the use AI option to toggle which one is passed or which one is started with the controller. But again, we could also use some property injection or property setting to modify those dependencies and take control over a ship. So I don't know if this is the best example, but it's a pretty decent example of something pretty close to something I've used. So normally what would the other thing I'd inject in is maybe different controllers. So instead of just injecting in a player input that's brand new and instantiated right there in the ship, we inject in one of the predefined ones. So for instance, I built a little spaceship game where you can have multiple controllers and then those controllers all have a script that's created and assigned with them. And then we can just inject those in to have them control the different ship parts instead of having to new it up in the ship. But we want to keep it relatively simple and hopefully understandable. Again, the key takeaway here is to pass in your dependencies and give your dependencies to objects instead of having them go out and find them. So if you're doing a lot of game object find object of type, it's a good option or a good idea to just kind of look and see, you know, can these dependencies just be passed into this object? If they can, it's usually a good idea to give that a try. Um, also, if you have a lot of static method calls, again, those can't really be easily swapped out without changing your class. So if you, if you never plan on swapping them and you're positive they're gonna stay the same, forever and you're not going to run any unit tests on them, fine, go ahead and keep them. But otherwise, just consider um, consider passing them in optionally too. Now, if you end up with, you know, 100 things getting passed into your constructors, that's also another problem. It means that your, your object that you're passing stuff into is doing way too much. It's dealing with way too many things. Those other sub things should probably be dealing with something else or dealing with, you know, the other components in them. So anyway, I think the, the key thing though, just separate out your code, uh, pass in dependencies wherever you can. Don't have 
you know, your ship motor require that it knows how to find an input, how to find uh, its health, or how to find all these other things. Just pass them in, make it all work, and you'll be happy that your code is a bit cleaner, a little bit easier to test, and a whole lot more separated. So I hope this is a little bit helpful. Um, if you haven't watched the other solid videos, I'd check those out too. They, I think, kind of bring this all together. It's w once you get an idea of all of the principles, you start to see how they work together and how they can make your project just a lot easier to work with, a lot more fun, and a lot more likely to be successful. So thanks for watching. Uh, don't forget to hit thumbs up, alerts, subscribe, and all that fun stuff, and share with your friends. And um, yep, that's it. Thanks.